Influence actually started um, back around 1989 when I started working with the IETF. Uh, I had an opportunity to lead um, the Dynamic Host Configuration Working Group, which developed the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. We worked on that protocol and published it finally about uh, 1995. It was picked up by uh, Windows, Windows 95, picked up by Microsoft, it was integrated into the Microsoft server. And so as Windows 95 came out, it revolutionized the way in which um, devices would connect to the internet. Prior to that time, uh, there was a lot of manual configuration that you'd have to go through. You'd have to type in a lot of uh, addresses and, and um, uh, subnet masks and other kinds of configuration information. All that was taken away by um, DHCP, done automatically. So you can just turn on your computer, plug it in, and it would get the DHCP information and, and take off. Uh, a few years later, we did the same thing for IPv6. You've heard of IPv6 as the, the new version of the IP protocol. And we needed that same functionality for DHCPv6, so we worked on that um, protocol and, in fact, published it in 2003. In fact, we just celebrated the 10th anniversary of the publication of, of DHCPv6 um, earlier this week. So DHCP has really had a, a strong influence on the Internet. It really automated the process of getting devices connected to the Internet, and it's the thing that, that makes it possible to take your uh, laptop at home, turn it on, connect wirelessly, and not have to do any configuration, any, any kind of work to get it to connect to the Internet. It just connects and, and starts working. There are a couple related to this. Uh, initial work on DHCP. The first is to, to give you an idea of how things have changed over the years. Uh, the reason I took on um, the DHC working group is that the chair of the IETF at the time had been a grad student with me a few years before that at Penn State University. And so he and I were having a social visit, enjoying a social visit, and we got together and uh, he told me about the IETF and told me about this, this configuration problem. And I, and I thought, gee, that sounds like a really interesting thing to do. So I went to uh, the, the first ITF meeting that I went to was in Cocoa Beach, 1989. We formed the DHC working group and uh, took off from there. And the part of that that was really interesting to me was that we had collaboration amongst um, all the major computer vendors, including both PC vendors and uh, other larger system vendors. Um, uh, collaboration together to bring this this protocol about. That is, there was no competition about it. We sort of checked our our vendor hats at the door, um, and and all worked together to make DHC uh, come together. We had people from Microsoft, from Apple, uh, from Sun Microsystems, uh, from Cisco, and and a, a variety of other vendors at the time, all working together to make this happen. in my mind, very unsettled. We're at a time of a huge um, uh, expansion of the internet outside of the kinds of, of internet connections and devices that we're familiar with. We've seen some of that over the past few years as we've moved from laptops, desktop computers to uh, smartphones and tablets, and, and we've seen a big increase. Right now, in, instead of a, uh, a tablet and um, uh, a laptop at home, you've got a, or a, you've got a tablet, two iPhones and a, um, a desktop computer. The next big expansion is going to be these very tiny little devices that we've come to call the Internet of Things. Um, uh, and I'm working on a project with some students at Purdue University to provide the IPv6 software that will run on these Internet of Things devices. And we're going to go from four or five or half a dozen, maybe 10 devices in a home to perhaps 20 or 100 devices in a home. And all of those devices will be directly accessible from the internet. And what's unsettled is how we're going to keep all of those devices um, safe and private and make sure that we have the appropriate security and, and access control in place so that we don't have problems with people from the outside coming in and, and manipulating our, our, our heating systems or unlocking doors when we don't want them to be unlocked. So there's a lot of work to do in that area of security and that's the part that's unsettled right now. Security is always the thing that we do last in the, in the IETF and, and we really need to be in, in front of it with this particular uh, expansion. My hope for the internet is that as we develop these new devices and we, we, act, we uh, provide um, these additional capabilities to all of the things that operate in your home, in your car, in buildings, that we can provide a, um, uh, 
provide a, a, an application development environment that's open and freely available and that lots of people can can participate in. So just like the, the um, development of apps for the iPhone or for Android, we'll have that same capability to develop those kinds of applications that can talk directly to the devices in the home, talk to things in your car, and bring them together uh, using the innovation of, of lots of different people, as opposed to just you know, sort of expert programmers or people who, who, who understand um, and have built how the network works. We want to make it accessible to uh, a much wider range of people. And my big fear for the internet is the security and, and, and privacy uh, problems. We want to make sure that while we're doing this, we provide the right kind of security and we provide the privacy that we need so that we're not um, exposing information that we don't want to expose. Some of the specifications, the specifications that we're developing in the IETF take security into consideration. Uh, I just finished working with the Zigbee Alliance, between Zigbee Alliance and the IETF on something called the Zigbee IP, pro, um, Zigbee IP specification. It's a way of running IPv6 out to these Internet of Things devices. And we integrated security into that from the very beginning. So when a device comes up on this network, it first has to authenticate itself into the network. It has to say, you know, I'm, I'm allowed to connect to this network. And at the same time, it checks that the network is the, the network that it really wants to con uh, connect to. So it gets information back from the network that proves to, the, to this new device that, yes, that's a good network and, it, and it's allowed to, it, to, to attach to it. So once we have that authentication in place, <clears throat> then we can um, exchange information so that the device can communicate uh, securely with all the other devices in the network, and it can um, uh, communicate privately. It can encrypt its uh, communication so that it can't be um, uh, listened in on and read by, by a third party watching the, the radio uh, communication. One thing is um, we want to encourage as much participation in the IETF or in other places and as much innovation as we can so that we can take advantage of all of these new new capabilities. We want to have the right um, uh, programming environments, the right development environments so people can really very easily take their ideas and put them in, in, into practice really, really quickly and get um, familiar with doing that at a very young age so that they're, you know, by the time you, you get to, to, uh, you get to going to college, you, you already have experience with um, um, building com uh, real computing, computing devices, doing things with real computing devices, and you're able to, you have a real passion and, and interest in, in, in building those kinds of, of tools and systems.